friends. Hello. Hi, how are you? I hope you guys are having an amazing day today. Hello and welcome to another internet history. Today I really wanted to talk about some drama that happened almost two years ago at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. That was basically one of the biggest upsets the podcasting community had ever seen. At the beginning of 2020, the Call Her Daddy podcast, which starred Alex Cooper and Sophia Franklin, was absolutely blowing up and breaking records, getting almost 12 million streams per podcast. Two of them were best friends. They seemed to have a very charmed life. They were on one of the best podcasts in the world, and somehow everything started to just fall apart. In April of 2020, the two hosts just kind of went radio silent and stopped posting podcasts or posting anything on their social medias and really left their fans in the dark. And because their fans were so used to consistent uploads from them, this was obviously very upsetting. What ensued ended up being some of the biggest drama the podcasting world had ever seen, and it got pretty crazy. The CEO of the company they worked for actually broke into their podcasting feed to make a statement. Their contracts were revealed. A friendship that seemed to be pretty strong ended up breaking up right before the fans' eyes, and fans were left to pick a side. Today, I want to explain why everything went down, how everything happened as it happened, and also talk about why this demise became so incredibly interesting to millions of people, even those who maybe never watched the podcast before hearing about it. So without further ado, uh, this is an internet history on the demise of the Call Her Daddy podcast, and let's jump right into it. But before we do, today's video has a sponsor, so let's roll to that. Hi friends, editing me here, and today's video is sponsored by Karma. Now, as a lot of you know, I'm getting married in the next few months, and one of the things I have a love-hate relationship with about getting married is the amount of white dresses that you need. I feel like you need one for a bridal shower, your bachelorette party. For me, it's a bachelorette trip, so I need a white outfit for each day. The rehearsal dinner, the engagement photos, just a lot of white dresses that I suddenly need to have in my life. But I've recently been on the hunt for some new white dresses, but a lot of them, especially for someone who's plus size, can be very expensive. For example, I found this adorable dress from ASOS, but it was $220 hairs and I was not paying that. Luckily for me, I have been using Karma for the past few months and I actually love this browser extension. The reason it kind of stands out to me above a lot of other browser extensions that I've tried that are similar to this is that you can actually save away into lists all of the different items you're looking at and you can put a little reminder on them to see if they ever go on discount. So I have a bunch of different lists. I have like my wedding inspo list, I have my summer vibes list, my house stuff like furniture that I'm looking at for the house. And once you put it in a list, Karma will then alert you if that product ever goes for sale, which is a super nice feature, especially if you're like me and you're always waiting for a deal. But the other reason I really like Karma is because they're able to go through, find just a bunch of different coupons for you. For example, for the white dress from ASOS, I actually really needed it sooner rather than later. It's something I wanna try for my bridal shower. And Karma was able to scan the internet and find 10 different coupons, of which the best deal will save me 15% off my purchase. All you have to do to get Karma is download the Chrome extension. On the Karma extension, you can visit a ton of your favorite stores. And like I said, products that you're interested in watching the price of, you can add to a bunch of different lists that you create. You'll get a notification when your item goes on sale or has a relevant coupon, and you can even get notifications for when things come back in stock. Also, if you shop at select retail partners, Karma will not only give cash back to you, but they will also give some cash back to a good cause. If you're interested in trying Karma, you can go to the link that is in my description box. I'll send you straight to the browser extension. I really think this is an awesome extension. I've never used anything like this before and I genuinely feel like it makes shopping really fun. It especially makes it if you want to just like window online shop. It's really cool because you can just add things onto your list as you go. But yeah, go check it out. Link down below. Thank you so much to Karma for sponsoring this video and always saving me money when I do my online shopping. And let's jump into the video. I think before we jump into what ended up happening and what led to the demise of Call Her Daddy, which is definitely the more interesting 
interesting part of this video, I do feel like it's important to sort of set the stage into how Call Her Daddy came to be in the first place. So first let's start with Alex. Alex Cooper actually graduated from Boston University in 2015 and she had a degree in movie and filmmaking. Also weirdly she was a division one athlete which I had no idea about but I was reading a bunch of articles like about her life. She won multiple titles for her school and actually went to Boston University on an athletic scholarship which I never would have guessed but I guess she always had a passion and a love for filmmaking and television making and editing and everything like that. Now Alex actually grew up in a very small town and from a young age really expressed a desire to move to a big city so I think that's why she went to Boston University and then after graduation moved to New York City just to sort of try to start a new life. Shortly after moving to New York City she actually started dating a really famous uh, major league baseball player. I literally cannot remember his name now and I had never heard of him before in my life but this definitely gave Alex sort of an opening to become I don't want to say a socialite in New York City but she was definitely talked about in like gossip blogs that go around New York City. So she was like kind of known and kind of had a little bit of a social media presence because of who she was dating. She was nowhere near like Paris Hilton. I feel like when you think socialite, you think like Lindsay Lohan, Paris Hilton. However, a year after moving to New York City in 2015, Alex was introduced by a mutual friend to Sophia Franklin. Now, Sophia had a bit of a different background. She had gone to Utah University and she actually got a degree in economics and was working at a financing firm when she met Alex. Their friendship story is kind of interesting because it basically just started as them really hitting it off immediately and becoming fast friends, but then very quickly learning that they actually had a very interesting dialogue and conversation together. There's a trip that they've both mentioned multiple times where they went to Texas together and they were at a bar and they were just like openly talking about their sex lives and their dating lives. They both felt like it was a super interesting conversation and something that other people would want to hear. And after this trip and this sort of conversation they had together, the two of them actually became roommates in New York City. Something that was really striking to me when I was putting together this script and reading this story was just how not long they were friends for. They were only friends from about 2016 to 2020, which is just about four years. And well, duh, and you can do that math. <laughs> Even I, a person who can't do math, could do that math. But they're only friends for like four years. And for some reason, when all of this drama went down back in 2020, I was under the impression that they had been lifelong friends who had known each other for decades and like that's why this friendship breakup was so sad but I think when you put into perspective that they only knew each other for four years a lot about the story and what happened starts to make a lot more sense. I'm not saying that you can't develop close bonds with people very quickly. One of my best friends right now is a girl that I've known for literally nine months like she's my best friend. If you ask me that's my best friend like a hundred percent. So that's not to say you can't form friendships especially in your 20s very quickly. But I will say, I think that the reason they got so close so quickly was because they were both in very similar life stages. They were young women who had just graduated college, trying to maneuver and navigate dating and becoming successful in New York City and wanting to like hustle and grind together. And I think that's what drew them to each other so instantly. And I feel as if something about friendships when you're right out of college in your early 20s are a very different different kind of friendships than ones that you might have for the rest of your life. Something I've learned over the course of my life, I'm 27 now, so I'm not exactly like wise yet, but something I did learn, especially in my early 20s, was that not every friendship that you have is necessarily meant to last your entire life. A lot of times, especially friendships in your early 20s, are much more meant to teach you lessons or to serve a purpose for you. And it does seem like both of them, whether good or bad, uh, did learn lessons lessons from each other, but they definitely were not lifelong childhood best friends. They met and then pretty shortly after meeting started this podcast. Now in 2018, so this was two years after Alex met Sophia, Alex was unemployed and pretty much openly has talked about the fact that she was living on unemployment checks. She was really trying to make YouTube work for her, but she wasn't having too much success on her channel vlogging. And that's when she was approached by one of her friends who gave her the idea to start a podcast. And Alex actually has said that she had no idea what a podcast even was when the opportunity was given to her. She just knew that it involved talking and she knew that she was probably going to be good at talking. I think something that's super interesting about this story is there's not really a lot of information on how the two 
actually decided to create this podcast together. But Sophia has said that despite having a really well-paying job in finance and a job that she felt satisfied in, I mean, it's what she got her degree in, she always had this sort of creative desire and this creative need to create something other than just doing financing. She always wanted to do something that more led to content creation. And so Alex and her together created Call Her Daddy. I don't think either of them knew when they were making the conscious decision to start Call Her Daddy that this show was going to become one of the biggest podcasts in the world. I don't think anybody would have ever guessed that, but the two of them basically used their cumulative social media following. So Sophia had like a decently sized platform on Instagram and Alex also had some social clout from people she had dated and kind of her life in the New York social scene. So they used their kind of collective clout to promote this podcast. However, I do want to stress, I've talked a lot, about, especially about podcasts, just saying how it's much easier for people with built-in audiences to start podcasts. That's why we see so many celebrities and YouTubers and social media influencers starting them. And I don't think it's fair to give the assessment that these two women had a built-in audience when they started Call Her Daddy. Like they had a little bit of a leg up, but definitely nothing super crazy. They started off their podcast and for the first four episodes, they were averaging about 12,000 listeners, which isn't bad by any means, but it's not like this stellar, amazing, right off the bat, they have this massive audience. Now, after listening to way too many episodes of this show, there's a few things and a few reasons I think that this podcast was so successful. I think one of the first reasons was that especially in 2018, I think young women, especially women in their 20s, were really craving relatability. I think that's something everybody always has been kind of craving is this relatability factor. And I think that a lot of women just wanted to listen to something that they could also relate to or that they could get something out of. Alex and Sophia were incredibly relatable. They openly talked about their sex lives and openly talked about their dating lives and openly talked about how hard it is to be in your early 20s and struggle with dating and finding a guy and living in a big city and trying to navigate life. Everything they were talking about, if you were a person in your early 20s, was mostly relatable to you. And even the stuff that wasn't relatable to you, it was funny. The way that they talked about things and talked about topics that are often seen as very taboo, like sex is obviously seen as a very taboo topic, the way that they discussed it, even if that's not something you're necessarily into, it was really funny. Like they were charismatic, they were relatable, and they were genuinely very funny. I also think the other reason the show was so successful beyond just the relatability factor and the openness that they had was that the show is really well edited. I think Alex put it best herself when she was talking about sort of the drama that all went down, but she talked about her editing process and her main goal was just to make sure that there was never a boring moment in the show. I think a lot of times podcasts can kind of lag and lull and get a little bit boring and she knew that in order for this podcast to be successful it had to be fast-paced and upbeat and something that was always going to be pulling the viewer's attention and I think she did successfully do that in her editing. Like I said like I was not super interested in the content of what they were saying but I was definitely very interested nonetheless simply because of how well edited it was. There was never a dull moment, there were constant jokes and right from the start, a really smart thing that they did was sort of pull inside jokes with their audience. So they would do a lot of callbacks to previous episodes and they had a lot of catchphrases, like there was the gluck gluck called their listeners the daddy gang. Like they really hook, lined, and sinkered that parasocial relationship and they just kind of went with it. One thing I do think that's interesting to note before I start talking about Dave Portnoy's acquisition of Call Her Daddy is that I think something that's never really talked about enough when we're talking about this situation is the amount of pressure that would be put on Sophia and Alex as friends. People definitely 1000% saw them as friends friendship goals. Like people wanted their best friend to be just like Sophia and Alex. They related to them. They saw their own friendships within their friendship. And I think that that amount of pressure to put on a friendship that was still relatively new, it was like two years old at this point, is something that definitely contributed to the deterioration
duration of the show eventually. While the two of them are obviously living together and knew each other very well, I still think that they're, it's kind of similar to how if you're in a public relationship on the internet. Like if you're in a very, very public, like I think about like David Dobrik, Liza Koshy, Lore DIY, Alex Wasabi, couples in general on the internet, and even famous couples, like celebrities. Like think about the Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, Jennifer Aniston situation. People have a really large investment into relationships. And so I think the pressure that it was probably put on them to continue being best friends, despite maybe some possible red flags, was probably something that ended up contributing to the downfall of the show. And I think having to jump into that role so quickly and assume that pressure so quickly is not something that's talked about enough. Now, after about four episodes of Call Her Daddy had been released, it caught the attention of Dave Portnoy, who owns Barstool Sports. And they reached out to Alex in particular about potentially getting the Call Her Daddy podcast under the Barstool Sports umbrella. I just have to input here that I don't like Dave Portnoy. I think he's a gigantic piece of trash and I'm not a fan of him. Um, however, I think that his business decision to see the potential in Call Her Daddy and also subsequently sort of the business decision to diversify the content that was happening on Barstool Sports was a really good one. Barstool Sports at the time was obviously focused on sports. Like all of their podcasts were mainly focused on sports. And not only that, but pretty much all of the people who hosted the Barstool Store, that is a fucking tongue twister. All of the people who hosted the Barstool Sports, there we go, podcasts were mostly men. So while I'm not saying that just because a podcast is hosted by a man, it can't have a woman demographic, but if I had to guess, they were probably lacking in woman viewership because a lot of women who tuned in probably didn't feel very seen or represented by the current hosts of all of these different podcasts. Call Her Daddy definitely benefited them because they were not only able to expand the type of hosts that they had, but they were also able to expand upon the content. And frankly, the very honest and sort of, um, explicit show definitely fit in with the Barstool Sports theme and branding. It wasn't super off base for them to suddenly be having a show about people talking about sex. Like it definitely was a good fit, especially at the time for what both of the parties were interested in. Now, I will say, I think one of the most interesting things about all of this drama was just how transparent it made contracts and the legalities of being a content creator under a brand. Before this happened, I don't think it was pretty clear how contracts looked for podcasters or how much money they were making or anything like that. But this whole situation absolutely exposed so much about how the world of contractual obligations work. Originally, when Sophia and Alex signed on to be a part of the Barstool team, they were each guaranteed $75,000 of each that year, the very first year, with increases of $10,000 every year. So by the end of the third year, they would theoretically be making $100,000, which honestly, for how many listeners they were getting when they signed on, made a lot of sense. However, when Barstool was able to put them on their feet, and also promote them, this podcast blew up. It was like an unprecedented amount of blowing up. They had so many monthly listeners from the get-go. Like as soon as it launched, it just immediately exploded. They went from about 12,000 weekly listeners to 12 million weekly listeners, and it became an instant success. Bigger than I think anyone uh, on either team could have ever fathomed. They had multiple brand deals on each podcast, and I'm sure for the amount of engagement they were getting, they were making so much off of that. And they also had a ton of different merchandise and alcohol sales that were all based around the Call Her Daddy brand. So despite signing contracts that guaranteed them $75,000. In their first year, they got a bunch of different raises and also a bunch of different bonuses that led to each of the girls making just over $400,000 a year. However, there was a bit of a discrepancy. Alex ended up making more than Sophia, and that's important for later. So we'll talk about that in a minute. However, behind the scenes, despite all of this success and all the money they were making, behind the scenes, there was a lot going on between not only the two girls, but also the two girls and Dave Portnoy and Barstow. In 2019, Sophia had started dating a guy named Peter Nelson, who worked for HBO Sports. And as the first year started ending on their contract, Peter Nelson started pushing Sophia and Alex to really reconsider how much they were getting paid and also renegotiate their contracts so they were being adequately paid. I think there's a great debate here that lies in should the two girls have even pushed to make more money to begin with? And the fact of the matter is, I think yes. 
I don't know if that's an unpopular opinion. I feel like it kind of is because I think a lot of people think they're like greedy assholes for asking for more money, but hear me out for a second. The first thing that's important to note, and this was actually discussed a little bit later when Alex made her video discussing the situation, but the first thing that's really important to note is that in their contract, they were allowed to renegotiate every year. So it's not like their contracts were made and they were completely set in stone and they just had to do whatever those contracts said no matter what. There was room to renegotiate every year in their built into their contracts. So people always said that they like never even legally had a ground had ground to stand on for renegotiating, and that's not true. The other good point that Alex made was that they already had made significantly more than what they were supposed to in their first year. So according to their contract, contract for that second year, they would be bumped down to $85,000 a year when the previous year they had made like 400,000 already. So like logistically renegotiations had to happen, which is true. I think that a lot of people hear the $400,000 salary number and they think that that's lunacy for making a podcast. And I don't disagree with you on that. However, I think what's even more important to note than how much the two girls were making is how much Dave Portnoy and Barstool were making. In his live feed where he talked talked about all of the drama, Dave said that he was losing over $100,000 an episode by the girls refusing to post, which if you add all of that up is $5.2 million a year, literally just for the podcast. That's not talking about the content they got out of the YouTube channel, the alcohol sales they got, the merchandise sales they got, any brand deals that they got that were outside of the podcast. Like he was making millions of dollars off of these women and off of their podcast and their talent. And even though 400,000 does seem like a lot of money, 400,000 of just simply the podcast money they were making. So if they're actually making $100,000 an episode, they're making 5.2 million a year. Just off of the podcast, he's they're only making 13% of that income, which in my opinion is not equitable given that they were the entire podcast. I low-key was looking back at this situation Situation, and I was getting really frustrated with the narrative that just because they were asking for more money or they were not happy with the salary they were getting meant that they were greedy or ungrateful. It makes sense to me that they wanted more money. They were making the company they were working for a lot of money. It reminds me of when people started getting really upset at beauty gurus for making a percentage of things or making money from sponsorships or affiliate codes thinking they were being greedy. When in reality, they were giving that company business and they deserve to be paid for it. It's literally the same concept. I'm not trying to sit here and be like, oh, 400K is something to sneeze at. But when the person you're working for is pocketing like multi millions of dollars, it does kind of seem like you're getting screwed over. With all of that being said, because I think the great negotiation about should they have been asking for a raise in the first place, with that being said, like you can fall where you want on that. I think that the way that Alex and Sophia went about all of this is what was so fucked up and also what was so sort of like scandalous. Basically how the story goes is that at the beginning of 2020, the girls decided that they were gonna renegotiate their contract and according to Alex, at the advice of Sophia's boyfriend, they sent in a new term sheet that was going to detail all of the different things that they wanted and all of the different things they wanted changed. The most notable things that have been said about this term sheet is that the girls were both asking for $1 million each for a salary for that year. And they were also asking to have an increase in the percentages they were making from merchandise and alcohol sales and everything like that. And most notably, the biggest thing that they were looking for was that at the end of this term, at the end of this contract, they would retain the IP of Call Her Daddy. For those of you guys that don't know, IPs is intellectual properties. So basically when you sell a show like this to a company like Barstool, even if you wanna leave the company, they would still retain the right to do Call Her Daddy. It basically protects a company's investment. So if for this exact case, if they buy a show and they put the initial money in, it's like they're investors in the company. They take over that intellectual property and then Sophia and Alex would not be able to just leave and go to say HBO Sports and do Call Her Daddy. They would have to do a completely different show. Barstool at this point in time owned the entire IP and Alex and Sophia were asking for that back after they
they left, along with a significant salary increase and also just like all of these other percentages. Now, this ask sheet was pretty much immediately rejected by Barstool. It's actually said by both Alex and Dave that he basically got this term sheet and just immediately stopped talking to them, like stopped all negotiations, wouldn't even entertain the idea because he said it was so ridiculous. And now looking at this two years later, I will say that I was a little bit more conspiratorial, I guess, than I was at the time when all of this happened, because I remember following this pretty closely and when it was all going down, despite not listening to Call Her Daddy. And I don't really remember thinking this, but now looking at it, it feels a little bit more obvious to me that Sophia's boyfriend, Peter Nelson, obviously had some ulterior motive in trying to get the Call Her Daddy girls to leave Barstool Sports. Seeing that he worked for one of their direct competitors, which was HBO Sports, I can imagine that his main objective was not to actually get them a raise or keep them at Barstool, but was more likely him trying to get them fired from Barstool and still get their IP somehow so that they could come over to HBO Sports and he could get sort of a promotion and like a pat on the back for bringing over one of the biggest podcasts in the world. I think that the problem with the Sophia and Alex situation situation was that they were being guided by someone who didn't have their best interests in mind. It was much more about his best interests. And I also think that because Alex and Sophia were very new to the world of social media and podcasting and being somewhat celebrities in their own right, I do think that the probability of them being persuaded and listening to the wrong people makes a lot of sense. Alex actually said as much in her video. She said that she felt like she was being pressured and being told that this was all part of the industry standard and that sending in a big term sheet like that and then negotiating was a big part of the process and everything like that. But that ended up not being the case for them. So after this term sheet was rejected and Barstool stopped with negotiations, according to Alex, Sophia and Peter kind of got the idea to start shopping the show around to different companies. So they were basically just going to leave Barstool and do the show with someone else, which they contractually were not allowed to do. They absolutely would have been sued and would have been in massive trouble for breach of contract. Even shopping around the show, I'm pretty sure, is a massive breach of contract because they were still very much under contract with Barstool. They didn't own Call Her Daddy or anything to do with that. And according to Alex, it seems like their plan was going to be to just start a brand new podcast. I would argue that Barstool probably could have sued them for even doing that. I, I mean, unless they made like a drastic change in content, I would imagine that the two of them just being together was enough to violate the intellectual property that Barstool actually owned. And I think there would have been a legal argument for that. Now, behind the scenes while all of this was happening, Sophia and Alex were starting to become very fractured. Alex really contributes this to Sophia's relationship and says that the relationship with Peter and his sort of need to be in charge of everything was starting to really wear on her. She felt like he was not acting in her best interests and in turn it led her to feel like Sophia wasn't acting in her best interest. It also came out during this time that Alex was making more money than Sophia. And again, Alex actually explained this in her video, but Alex was making more money simply because she did all of the editing for Call Her Daddy. Alex made a good point that she was given a raise by Dave and basically accepted that raise because she was doing more work, which meant that they weren't sharing 50-50% of the profits evenly. But in my opinion, they never should have been in the first place. Like if Alex was editing a 100% of the podcast like she said she was. Sophia has never disputed that claim and Dave has also backed up the claim that Alex edited it. I can't imagine why in the first place they would be splitting it 50-50 because the workload is not 50-50. Editing the podcast is like its entire own separate job. That's why people hire editors for podcasts and YouTube videos. It's because it's so much different and honestly a lot more, not I wouldn't even say harder than being like the on-screen talent. It's definitely a lot more time consuming than it is to film. Like I'm going to film this video, for example, for probably an hour and a half to two hours, and then I'm going to edit it down to like 45 minutes. But that editing process is going to take me easily 10 to 12 hours. Alex said that when Sophia found out about this raise, she was really upset and angry. And not only that, but she said behind the scenes, Sophia had been really upset with Alex sharing that she edited Call Her Daddy by herself because she said that it made her look bad in the public that Alex was doing 
more work than she was. Which is why Alex said she didn't tell her about the raise in the first place. But once this was found out, there began to be a lot of fractures in their friendship. A few weeks after these negotiations had been halted, Dave Portnoy actually found out that Alex and Sophia were trying to shop around, call her daddy. And he actually said when he was filming his response to all of this, that if it hadn't have been for COVID and COVID happening right around that time, he probably would have just sued them and would have just let the whole thing go. But he said because COVID was happening and he was a little bit stressed as a business owner, he wanted to strike a deal with them and wanted to ensure that he was making extra cash so he could keep his business afloat because everything was so uncertain. So he called Sophia and Alex to his apartment and there's this sort of like famous rooftop meeting. If you're familiar with this drama, I know you've heard that phrase a trillion times, but there was this sort of infamous rooftop meeting where Dave basically offered them a really good deal. Offered them a minimum of $500,000 a year with a salary. He offered them an increase in sort of merchandise sales, alcohol sales, and most importantly, he shortened their contract. And so instead of being kind of trapped into bar stool for two more years, it would only be for a 12 month period. And then at the end of that 12 month period, they would get the IP to call her daddy. All parties have admitted that this deal would have easily made them well over a million dollars had they just gone through with it right then and there. Like a million dollars each. They both would have been millionaires from this deal. And honestly, hearing all of that, it's from an outside perspective, like obviously I don't know the ins and outs of podcasting business and shit, but like that sounds like a pretty good fucking deal. You're gonna be making over a million dollars a year for basically three days of work a week. That's pretty awesome. I will say too, I think that's the other reason people were so annoyed by this situation and particularly annoyed at Sophia was because when you hear that, you're like, wow, a million dollars a week for three days of work maximum. Like that was literally what the offer was. And they were making an adequate amount and an adequate percentage based on what Barstool was making, which is all you can ever really hope for as a content creator. Now, Alex definitely marked this moment as something that really changed her friendship with Sophia and caused a lot of irreparable damage. She said that after this meeting, Alex was pretty much immediately ready to take this deal. She was super good with it. She was excited to get the intellectual property. She was excited by the money she was making. She felt like it was a really fair deal. However, Sophia did not feel the same way as Alex and she felt like they were still getting screwed. She felt like they were still not making enough money. She felt like they were still having all of these issues. So Sophia decided that she wanted to kind of return with her own terms and sort of negotiate the deal even further, despite Alex thinking that the deal was basically done on her end. This is also the period of time, this is in April of 2020, when the two of them completely stopped posting on their podcast, which again, put them in breach of contract, but they basically refused to talk or refused to post anything until a contract was signed for them. And I kind of see that perspective. I can kind of see how they wouldn't want to keep doing things while they were in active negotiation. I think they were doing it as a way to try and like kind of hold their ground and have leverage, but it definitely backfired because after six weeks of not posting on their podcast feed and six weeks of negotiating and going back and forth and having all of these problems, Dave Portnoy eventually went onto their podcast feed and exposed everything that was going on. He talked about the drama, he talked about the contracts, he talked about them not getting along anymore, and he really just laid everything out for everyone from his own perspective. In this episode, he basically slammed them for being greedy and ungrateful, and basically the entirety of social media, and also just the media in general, started writing about this and talking about this and his episode made this story really blow up. Before then, there had been rumblings and sort of articles written about how they weren't posting. Their first year contracts had actually been leaked to the New York Post, so they were making articles about all of this, but nobody knew what the real story was and what was really going on until Dave got on their feed and basically exposed everything. He also exposed that Alex had agreed to the deal and had agreed to the terms and that she was going to be continuing on and doing this podcast by herself instead of doing it with Sophia, which I think was really jarring, especially to their fans, because they had grown over the past year and a half 
to love these people as a duo. They were seen as like the ultimate friendship goals and all of a sudden it felt like they were going through a friend divorce and in turn I think their fans had to go through a little bit of that friend divorce. Now after Dave posted this feed, this led Alex Cooper to making her own YouTube video where she sort of chronologically went through what exactly happened and she definitely filled in the blanks of Dave's story. In this video, Alex really goes into detail and explains everything that happened, but I think the major points to take away were what happened after this rooftop meeting with Dave Portnoy. She said that after this meeting, everything changed with her and Sophia. They were on very different pages, but she still wanted to stick by Sophia and do the show with Sophia, so she was willing to do basically whatever Sophia wanted to do in order to get the deal through. They had calls with their lawyers basically every single day, and every single day, Sophia would add a new term or a new person percentage that she wanted or a new thing that she wanted from Barstool and from this deal. And Alex felt like it became very money motivated. She described it like whack-a-mole. She said that they would meet a term. So they would go from like 10% on merchandise up to 15. And then Sophia would have another thing that she had a problem with, with the deal. Like they kept getting super close to finalizing, but they never could close the deal because Sophia didn't want them to. She also said that Sophia was negotiating in bad faith. She said that she had this idea to basically get fired from the show so that way Alex had to do the entirety of the show for the year and then like swoop around at the end to get the IP. She said Sophia was hyper paranoid that Dave was going to hack into their Instagrams or their podcast feeds and delete everything. And she also said that she genuinely felt that Sophia was only going through this process so that Barstool would get so fed up with them that they would let them out of their contract and then they would be able to go to the other place that Sophia, or I guess Sophia's boyfriend at the time, wanted them to go to. Alex said the last straw for her was when they were really close to ending the negotiations and she was sent a new list of terms that Sophia had asked for. And it was almost nearly identical to the original term sheet that Dave Portnoy got that he told them to go fuck themselves with. And that's when she kind of realized that she had to make a decision for herself, basically. Like she either had to stay in this sinking ship with Sophia and either get sued by Barstool or not get the IP, which is something she really greatly cared about. And she said Sophia didn't really care about the IP, she just wanted out of the Barstool deal. So Alex made the decision to go in and negotiate her very own deal with Barstool, and that was how she became the singular co-host of Call Her Daddy. I think the saddest part of her YouTube video was really just her talking about, she wasn't even necessarily upset about the loss of a co-host, she seemed fairly confident that she could do it by her herself, but she really just said the hardest part about it was not only losing her friend to what she felt was greed, but also losing her friend to a boyfriend who she felt was steering her in the wrong direction. Now, Sophia actually did something really interesting when all of this was happening. She made a very short, like two and a half minute uh, Instagram story where she didn't really say anything. She just said, there's two sides to every story. Don't believe everything you hear. And like, thank you guys for all your support and then she just left the internet. Like she completely ghosted. And I actually found an interview she did with Adam22 who like, ugh. but I found an interview she did with him where she actually said that that was purposeful. She said she wanted to ghost the internet and sort of recollect her thoughts and recollect her mental health because she was getting dragged on social media. I would say predominantly people took the side of Alex over Sophia. But I think the main reason for that is because Sophia never said her side of the story. In situations like these, people always see things differently until they hear the other person's side. That's why I think we see this phenomenon on the internet where there's always this sort of switching up and changing your opinion about drama that happens that's more interpersonal like this one. Because obviously both people are gonna have very different sides. It's just like any fight in real life. Everyone is gonna have a different perspective and a different side to everything. But by Sophia ghosting and really never fully explaining her side of the story, people weren't able to get any of that empathy for her. They didn't hear her perspective because she didn't offer it. So people painted her as absolutely the villain of this sort of story, which I think had a detrimental impact on her career. When she was on the Adam 22 podcast, she was discussing and talking about how she felt like it was the right thing to do because she wanted to ghost 
give people time to miss her and then come back with like a brand new podcast on her own. She described it to what she would want to do if you had an ex-boyfriend, you'd want them to miss you. But I think the problem was people weren't really missing her yet. They were still just angry with her for never fully explaining why and how this situation with these seemingly two best friends turned out the way that it did. I don't know what you guys think about this and I'd be interested to hear, but I think it poses an interesting question of if people think it's better to just ignore all of the drama and like come back as if nothing happened, or if you think sometimes responses are required. I'm of the opinion that I mean, you can do whatever you want with your life, but I'm of the opinion that if somebody is spreading a false narrative about you, it's really, really important to correct that. Because even if you can still kind of come back from that and have, you know, fans or following or whatever, even if you can come back from that, there's still always going to be those people who you probably could have told your side to and could have been empathetic to it, but they weren't because you never gave them the chance to be. I think truly what it came down to, because I, I don't necessarily buy that Sophia like ghosted and that was her true mindset. I think the truth of the matter probably was that there was probably a lot of truth in what Dave and Alex were saying about Sophia. Not to say that she probably did not have her own perspective that would have provided insight, but I think a lot of what they were saying was probably true. And I think the reason that she didn't talk about it was because she didn't want to admit that a lot of what they said was true. However, I can only speculate about that because she's never, she never talked about it. <laughs> so with all of that being said, and all of the drama now sort of being explained. I do just want to talk about the perception of Sophia and Alex for a second because I do think there's a lot of ingrained sexism there. I think that oftentimes women are seen as greedy or money hungry or not thankful of what they have if they ask for more money or they ask for raises or they ask to be paid what they're worth. And I think that's really, really frustrating. I don't necessarily agree with the way that Alex and Sophia went about getting their raises from Barstool, but I don't think they were unreasonable to ask for a raise in the first place, nor do I think they were unreasonable to stand their ground and really try to force the issue. They were getting screwed over by Barstool with their original deal. Based on how well the podcast ended up doing, they were getting screwed over. And even though the secondary deal that was offered to them was definitely much much more fair it doesn't make them money hungry or like vindictive because they wanted that. They were entitled to that money because of what they were bringing to the Barstool brand. And I don't think it was wrong of them to ask for it. I don't even think it was wrong of Sophia to ask for more money. I think what was wrong on Sophia's part was negotiating in bad faith and negotiating in a way that made it so no matter what happened, she wasn't gonna get what she wanted and she wasn't gonna be happy. And I also think we're kind of both Sophia and Alex kind of fucked up in this. Which again, it makes sense because they'd only been friends for like four years at this point. But I think both of them just wanted to do what was best for them. And if leaving Call Her Daddy and leaving Barstool is what Sophia thought was best for her, and if staying was what Alex thought was best for her, I respect both of those opinions and both of those perspectives. It's, it's at the end of the day, it's their lives. Like Sophia did probably screw herself out of a lot of money, but if that's what she wanted to do and that's what she felt was best, I don't think she should necessarily be villain for that. I think she should only be criticized for the way she went about it and the way that she tried to kind of bring her best friend down with her. Now, as all of this sort of came to a head, Alex was announced as a single podcast host for Call Her Daddy, and she started releasing her first few episodes, which I will admit were pretty awkward to listen to. I think she was trying to find her footing, not having someone else to bounce around with. And for a while, there was a lot of rumors that Sophia would actually be replaced. People thought Miley Cyrus was gonna replace Sophia as the podcast host, but eventually she decided that the show was just going to be her. And the other really interesting decision she made was to take Call Her Daddy in a different direction. She talked a lot about in her first few episodes back how unfulfilled she had started to feel in the content that she was creating with Sophia and how she was kind of sick of only talking about sex and dating and relationships and hookups and how she wanted to be more meaningful and go deeper into conversations. And this pivot actually proved to be very positive. She's actually much more focused now if you look at the Call Her Daddy content in 2022. It's much more interview based. She constantly has different YouTubers and social media stars and celebrities on her podcast 
to do these really, really long form interviews. And she's actually really good at it. I've enjoyed, even before I thought about making this video, I had watched her interview with Julia Fox. I watched her one with Emma Chamberlain. I watched the Tana Mojo interview. Like she definitely has a knack for pulling out the personal thoughts of someone else and asking engaging questions that are very different than a standard interview would be. Sophia actually went on to ghost social media for about six months, like I said. But when she came back, she came back with the announcement that she was going to be starting a new podcast called Sophia with an F. It's really hard to find reliable statistics on how well this podcast is doing. But based on a few different articles I saw, they said that it was averaging about 150,000 viewers per episode, which is nothing to like stick your nose up at. Like that's a lot of fucking viewers for a podcast, but it's certainly not where she was when she was on Call Her Daddy. Like if you compare that to the millions and millions and millions of listeners she had on the show, it is a much smaller number. And on top of that, I think you can't really look at that number if it's accurate and say that she didn't suffer a great hit to her reputation and likability from all of this drama. And still to this day, Sophia has never really fully given her side of the story. She's still pretty much stayed silent about it. She brings it up in interviews from time to time or brings it up on her podcast from time to time, but there's really no anything on her part. She seems to have just really wanted to move on and forget about the situation. It kind of seems like Alex has too. Alex hasn't really talked about this situation in a very long time. She's kind of just kept her head down and kept going with Call Her Daddy. And in 2021, when her contract with Barstool Sports was up, she actually signed with Spotify for a $60 million podcast deal. It was a year. $60 million for one year podcast deal that really solidified her spot as one of the top female podcasters in the world. And Dave Portnoy actually gave his opinion on this deal and said that he was really happy with it. He was really proud of her. He thought it was a really good deal for her. And also he was able to maintain the licensing rights for any merchandise sold through Call Her Daddy. So Barstool was still making money. So he was happy. <laughs> I think the end point here is very interesting. Um, now that we're all through the drama, I think the final thoughts that should be had on this topic are, there's a lot of them. So let me try to compartmentalize them in my brain. The first final thought I would like to point out is that I think what this drama really showcased is how important it is to be aware of contracts you're signing when you're first starting out with something. This is like prime example number one of why I think it's really important for YouTubers to always think about best case scenario. I feel like a lot of times you see something like a $75,000 deal that's for all of these years and like ever and you're like, oh my God, that's so much money. Let me just take it. But I think what this taught us is that you never know what's going to happen with yourself and you never know if your own brand is going to become something that that is way more successful and way more popular. You could literally blow up overnight as the Call Her Daddy girls did. And a lot of companies, even though I don't really like Dave Portnoy, I have to say, the fact that he was even giving them raises throughout that year and paying them adequately throughout that year is incredibly impressive because a lot of companies would not have done that. And a lot of companies wouldn't have even bothered renegotiating with them. They would have just been fucked for like three years, making literal pennies to the amount of money that the people they were working for were making off of them. I think that's a really interesting thing. It really brought to the forefront Forefront, the idea of contractual obligations for influencers and monetary gain and monetary value of influencers. The other thing I think it points out is just the idea that on social media, I think a lot of times, and this is very, I mean, parasocial relationships are nothing new. This isn't like a groundbreaking concept I'm talking about here. But I think a lot of times on social media, we form these parasocial relationships with people. We get very invested and attached to friend groups and friendships and relationships. And a lot of times what we don't really think about, I do this too, like I'm very invested. Jenna and Julian, are you kidding? I'm so invested in their relationship, it's stupid. We're seeing a very small curious percentage of the friendship. Based on Alex's video, it seems like her and Sophia maybe had been having problems even before this show started, even before all of this negotiation stuff started, and that they had maybe been struggling with communication and running a business together behind the scenes. And I'm sure that it wasn't easy to navigate those problems and those issues while they were having to display to the public a very 
perfect friendship. They were supposed to be the perfect embodiment of what friendship was. And I think that that would be really difficult for anyone to maintain. I think this was a wake up call to a lot of podcast hosts and a lot of people who worked with their friends to just always keep an eye on these types of situations. Because even though there is this sort of insurmountable pressure to always appear perfect, if you're not addressing the stuff that's happening behind the scenes and you're not addressing any sort of communication issues behind the scenes, it's very easy for these situations to bubble over into being a massive problem. I'm really interested to know what you guys think. What did you think back then when all of this drama was happening? What do you think now, two years later, that all of the dust has kind of finally settled on the call her daddy situation? I'm very curious to know your thoughts. Um, but yeah, I love you guys so much. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please like and subscribe or just like or just subscribe or do neither. Honestly, just so happy you're watching me. Thank you so much for being here. My merch, my social media, and my podcast and vlog channel will be linked down below along with my social justice spotlight, which you should definitely go check out. And yeah, I love you guys so much and I will see you in the next one. Bye! Bye. Uh -huh.